<laughs> right now, I'm just thinking about how messy my desk is and what you're seeing. Is, is, is the shot okay, actually? <laughs> Good. <laughs> This is my lab where I do alchemical experiments, that is, try to reproduce the uh, results and the experiments that were done by alchemists in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. To do this, I have authentic labware. So one of the most common pieces of labware is the retort. Uh, what you do is you put your substance to be distilled here, uh, put it in a sand or ash bath, and Cork it up, heat it, and whatever is volatile will condense here in this part and run out. Um, I also have one that I keep at home that I use on the kitchen stove to distill after dinner drinks in. Right, so I also have some of the products of alchemy here. Um, I actually find it's easier to label them in symbols in Latin to use the old terms than to try and use modern terms for them. This one supposedly, let's see, it contains the the sulfur of antimony from the regulus of antimony, which has been sublimed with salamoniac. A lot of what I'm involved in is trying to get a better understanding of what alchemy was and what alchemists actually did. This has always been a problem, however, because the texts that they've left us are very secretive. They're often highly metaphorical, they're written in a kind of code, and they're filled with extravagant imagery, often very beautiful woodcuts, but forbidding in the sense of what does it all mean? So these extravagant Baroque images that clutter alchemical texts from the 16th and 17th centuries often have a hidden chemical meaning. It was a coded way of communicating, both concealing from people who were unworthy of the knowledge, but revealing it to the people who were in the know or were worthy of being in the know. So, for example, if we wanted to make aqua regia, a solvent that's able to dissolve gold, today we could take nitric acid and put ammonium chloride in it and make that solvent, but an alchemist might describe it as say, uh, might describe it by saying, let the red dragon devour the white eagle. Or, rather than saying it in words, he could draw an image of an actual dragon devouring an eagle. One of the things that I did some years ago was to look at the papers of Robert Boyle, famous character, we all learn Boyle's Law about gases. One of the things that I discovered in his papers was a huge amount of work on trying to make the Philosopher's Stone and transmute base metals into gold. Most alchemists described it as a heavy red substance, a powdery or waxy substance. And if you were able to make it in the laboratory, you could take just a small amount of it, drop it into a crucible of molten tin or molten lead, and a few minutes, it would transmute it all into pure gold. One of the things that impressed them the most was the so-called star of antimony. It's a crystalline pattern that develops on the surface of antimony when it cools under just the right conditions. So what they would do is they would take uh, some of the antimony ore called stibnite, put it in a crucible, melt it down, it melts very easily, and add iron as a reducing agent. And if they did it right, just right, sometimes when they took the button of metallic antimony out from underneath, it would have this beautiful pattern on the surface that looked to them like a star. And so, if the Star of Bethlehem signified the birth of someone so important, the star here could signify the production of a substance very important to what they were trying to do. As a historian of science, what I'm trying to do is get a truer, more accurate depiction of the past. In particular, how scientific ideas developed, where they came from, who developed them and why. It tells us more about how our ancestors were involved in the same kind of process as we are, about trying to understand the world that we live in, trying to manipulate it, trying to use it for valuable ends. I'm Larry Principe. I'm professor of chemistry and professor of history of science and technology at Johns Hopkins University.